artists of today, you're existing in the moment of memes and short attention spans, where music sales are not enough. Profits per stream are a percentage of a penny, and although in a matter of minutes a viral video can change your circumstances, when your flame fluctuates, what do you have left? At Hip Hoppreneur, the music industry's first leadership consultancy, we provide you with the tools to answer that question and hone your talent beyond the music, allowing you to define your impact in a more meaningful and sustainable way. That's why we've designed a live streaming series called Discover Success Beyond the Music. The series will introduce artists to four key elements, leadership, brand alignment, entrepreneurial development, and power brokering. These factors develop individuality and guide as a blueprint for long-term success beyond the mic, outside the art, and the industry. In this new era, leaders have access to places where many artists won't and where brands get left behind. Register now at the hiphoppreneur.com. Hip Hoppreneur, because artists mature. Welcome, welcome. Week number three, entrepreneurial development. The topic tonight, I'm Cedric Muhammad, CEO of The Hip Hoppreneur. I want to thank all of you all who joined us through Shindig, this incredible platform that we have the privilege of using, uh, not only to present to you in a one-way fashion, but in an interactive fashion, uh, also enabling you to benefit from what we like to call a network effect that would be communicating with like-minded individuals who have a similar self-interest uh, as you do. And regardless as to whether you interact uh, on the business level with us, you can begin to form relationships around the ideas that are shared here around these events and stay in communication with one another. So we encourage you to put on the, um, the camera, to put on the microphone, allow that to go live so that individuals can uh, interact and see you. So this is the third part of our series. And in some, you know, e each of them I enjoy in a different way. But this one may be the most meaningful to me in the sense that it may hold the key to unlocking some of the dilemma and, and a solution for those who have been wrestling with trying to figure out how do they differentiate themselves artistically. And that has become, in some instances, almost impossible in terms of the sound, acoustically, um, in terms of lyrically even, the idea being how do you go from an era where people use samples to where individuals use live bands to where other individuals are are using totally uh, a digital audio workstation like Pro Tools. So what we want to do is put the focus on that which can differentiate you. And, and our focus tonight will be on the business side, creating a business from the ground up, uh, doing whatever it is that you have to do to have a presence and become a person in the community and then interact with people on the basis of your ability to create conversation, generate story, build the brand, and then on the back end, support the music. So I want to pull up one of the PowerPoints for this week. And this is an, a very important infographic. We're going to talk about Nipsey Hussle and Jay-Z. But we're going to do it through the lens of what we call the community cash box. And so this is a big view of it. You may not be able to totally read that. I'm going to pull up a smaller version of it to give you an idea. But take a look uh, from left to right. Sources of cash inflows, community cash box, sources of cash outflows. And this is based upon a 1971 study of 
the uh, the community economics of the, the the economic development model that was dominating in the black community and the question of how can you track when a dollar comes into the community and when it exits. So a gentleman by the name of Robert Brown that we give all the credit in the world to, he dealt with something called the ghetto cash box. And so we've adapted it, interpolated that, but we give him credit uh, for an incredible study that appeared in the black uh, political economy journal in 1971. So let me, back out of that and let's take a look at it one uh, phrase at a time or one page at a time okay while that's up i want to talk about nipsey hustle and jay-z and where the development model in hip-hop is so jay-z as many of you know about two three weeks ago was credited with Forbes magazine with being hip hop's number one or first billionaire. The question of whether it was Dr. Dre or, or him, I'll let them debate that. I think Forbes does a great service with that list. I also have problems with the way that they formulate assets and net worth, and we'll deal with that at another time. I've already recorded a dialogue that I've had uh, over that. But when you look at Jay-Z's development model and he's held up primarily as the quintessential role model for anyone who wants to do uh, something outside of the business or grow beyond it in the 23 years or so that it took for him to arrive at the figure that they say is a billion dollars the businesses were primarily of course music then there was a heavy alcohol beverage component there was clothing there was real estate there was art and on the music side, there was, I guess, what you could call a technological play on the music in Spotify, the streaming music play. So he owned his publishing, got back his publishing. He owned his masters, got back those. Had Rockaware, sold that off. Had Has ownership stakes in two beverages, one a Cognac, and there's another brand, real estate property. If you look at how Forbes values his what they call his economic kingdom, the music portion of it is really the least valuable. The, the larger portion of it is, is beverages, alcohol in particular. So the Jay-Z model is, is what I would call the more traditional model that artists of today look up to and try to take uh, pointers from. Uh, Nipsey Hussle, in, his, in, in the case of Nipsey Hussle, Jay-Z was an inspiration as he is for many other people. So fast forward to this year and with his untimely passing, uh, but nothing happens out of season. Nipsey Hussle's passing gave us the testament of his business model. And so that's what he left behind. And people have been celebrating and studying that. His model relied less on music and more on land, real estate development, clothing. The clothing element was still there as a big component, but it was much more rooted in the neighborhood, much more focused on the community um, development model that we're going to talk a little bit more about more tonight. So take a look at the community cash flow, the sources of cash inflows, the community cash box. I want you to focus in on 2A, Earnings from goods and services exported by community residents in the value added portion only. So we're going to look at 2A and we'll look at 7A. And then this is something that we walk clients through as, as we give them a little bit of a snapshot of how they need to be thinking about their career outside of the music and their, their legacy, their capacity to, to increase their net worth. So in the, I would say the 70s, 80s, 90s, even into the 30s, the 40s, 50s, the communities that produced most of the art, a lot of what are called minority communities in the United States, they had the, the benefit of having people come to the neighborhood in many cases to enjoy the music. So there were nightclubs. If you look at Harlem, Harlem is a great example of two-way. You had earnings from services, entertainment services, the venues, where the music was performed 
were based in the community because people at that time were, were in taking live performances much more than they were uh, purchasing recorded music. So those nightclubs, uh, those restaurants, those, those supper clubs, those establishments, they were the linchpin of a big part of the economics of the community. That no longer became true by the time hip hop had emerged and grown maybe into its, its 10th and 20th year. Most of the nightclubs, the concert halls, the venues where hip hop was performed were outside of the communities that produced the artist. So you can see that inflow actually became an outflow and we'll get to that a little bit later. So a bit of criticism, when you look at what most artists are celebrated for creating in terms of economic development, they're being celebrated for business activity that takes, that has dollars circulating outside of the neighborhood or the community from where they're from. And very little of their investments are on the ground, build institutions and keep the, the cash flow circulating in the community. Now you could, if you look at Jay-Z's empire, I don't see anything there that's rooted in Marcy projects or the neighborhood where he comes from. Doesn't mean it does not mean he's not inspiring people. We know he is. Doesn't mean that people who are not artists are being motivated by him to do certain things in those neighborhoods. But what's celebrated as the successful model that any artist should follow has you building things outside of the community that you came from and has you um, getting into industries that don't fulfill the basic needs and wants of the people. So to me, what resonated about Nipsey Hussle, and, and again, I asked so many people who, who respect the music, who know the music, they, they, they hardly referenced any songs of Nipsey Hussle's. It was always what he was doing in the community. So he had actually transcended art, the, the profile of an artist, and he had become what we call a leader. Now, what was his model? So his model, the mixtape, obviously we know to some degree what RZA and what Wu-Tang, well, what RZA tried to accomplish by making that one Wu-Tang album so rare that it would command a higher price, selling one album reportedly for $2 million. Nipsey Hussle followed that same principle. He understood that the more rare a thing is, the more valuable it is, the more scarce it is, the more dear the price. And so selling mixtapes for $100 and mixtapes for $1,000, that was part of his foundation. Then getting signed and then not having the artists that were signed become the property of the label, him maintaining his masters. So even though into a label or signed with a label, he had more of a joint venture, independence and autonomous based deal where he maintained uh, the ability to leverage those assets down the road and outside of the jurisdiction of a 360 label deal. So off the bat, he's starting off several le levels above what the traditional uh, hip hop artist is. Then the clothing line, he was able to carry those same principles from the mixtape into the clothing line. And then he buys property in the neighborhood where he lived, where he grew up and was starting businesses there. So everything that I've just said about Nipsey Hussle was gra is ground up. It's, it's from the bottom working its way up. More of what Jay-Z was doing was top down. So now this is where it gets interesting. Even though both artists were doing things that were inspiring and empowering people, it still wasn't and an, an, an yet to be a model for Nipsey before he was um, assassinated, killed. It was still not an institution, an institutional building model at its core where you would have entrepreneurs who were not artists uh, becoming the hub of economic activity that Nipsey said was his goal, which was vertical integration. So Nipsey was, was trying to control and put people in business all along the supply chain, primarily for retail. He had other visions for technology. So vertical integration and horizontal integration are two different things. Horizontal integration is say, 
I have a, a enterprise that is a restaurant and I want to expand in another country, I, I buy another restaurant or I grow into another restaurant in another place. It's the same business. I'm growing horizontally. I'm getting bigger and wider doing the same thing. Vertical integration is say, I have a restaurant, but I have a farm. And the farm takes it from the land to the man where I grow something. And then what I grow supplies my restaurant. And then what the restaurant sells becomes a packaged good that we can sell in a store. So from the land to the restaurant to the store, that's vertical integration. It's the same. It's the supply chain of a particular sector that we're building in. OK. So ultimately, that's the goal where Nipsey was headed. I've never seen Jay-Z, although I've seen uh, Jay-Z cr critique gentrification. I've never seen Jay-Z really talk about the vertical integration model. I'm sure those of you who know his lyrics, you might be able to find some inspiring examples. Jay-Z says so many things uh, that carry weight economically. But his model is more partner with a corporation, uh, have them take some of the front end risk and then share in the profits. Now, and that's some of the tension between Jay-Z and Dame Dash uh, that we can talk about constructively down the road. I, I had interaction with Rockefeller. I can tell you the, the disposition of, of someone like Dame Dash is to own everything. Uh, in some ways, Wu-Tang was a lot like that, kind of like own it. Even if you don't have the reach or the same platform, own it and then uh, grow from there. Hire your own, build that way. Jay-Z would rather find, find a great partner who does it well and lend his name to it and then get equity from the relationship and build an asset from it that way. So t two ways of looking at it. Okay, so... Let's talk about what is the hardest part to understand. And if you have a question, just go right ahead and type in your question and, and we'll publish it and I'll get to it in a minute. I just want to open up by explaining some economic uh, fundamentals that contextualize what I call the two bookends of the, of the, of the uh, business development model that, that can provide a reference for what we talk about entrepreneurially. So where things went when Nipsey Hussle passed away is where we have to put a critical eye. So the idea that he and his partners had was to replicate to some degree what he was doing in LA in 10 other markets from a retail perspective. Recently, uh, Charlemagne, um, David Gross, Nipsey's partner, T.I., and there was another artist. They were on Capitol Hill meeting with members of the Congressional Black Caucus. My understanding is they, they also met with uh, President Trump's Secretary of the Treasury. And they were talking about how to do, promote economic development through opportunity funds and opportunity zones. The opportunity zone comes out of the context of the old empowerment zones and enterprise communities of the 80s and 90s, really the early 90s signed, really popularized by Jack Kemp, the idea, but legalized and instituted in terms of legislation and law under President Bill Clinton. That was what brought us the Starbucks. That was what brought us the Magic Johnson theaters. Many people believe that that model put tons of small businesses out of business at the community level. And so the opportunity uh, opportunity zones and the opportunity fund concept is the evolution of that that seeks to correct one or two things that were not developed as well in the enterprise uh, community and, uh, and empowerment zone formula. And that was you were not able to bring in a really big investor into a quote unquote, distressed or impoverished area. So under President Trump's 19, uh, pardon me, 2017 uh, tax law, they put in a provision that would incentivize the creation of these funds. 
and it was primarily geared toward real estate and hoteliers, hotel developers, people like President Trump, who's a, a real estate developer, who would get an incentive where they would have tax payments deferred or eliminated totally if they were able to produce a profit on an investment in one of these areas. And so that was what that's the blueprint for the opportunity zone. And it was designed primarily, again, for real estate developers and people who were building hotels and properties. So Nipsey Hussle and David Gross saw the, 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 the connection and the intersection between what they were doing and some of these incentives that are being provided for big developers outside of the community. So where you have to be careful with this is look at 7A on the community cash flow infographic. That's capital investments from outside the community. Now, you could get TI, you could get Nipsey Hussle's business partner, you could get Khaled, and the idea that they were talking about something that hiphopreneur is also champion, which is you try to get the person from that local area to be a champion of economic development, and you challenge them to start to build where they're from. So they mentioned Carmelo Anthony. You could get all these guys together. They could put all their money together. They still would not be the primary beneficiaries or who the Opportunity Fund or Opportunity Zone was intended for. It's intended for people that are not from those particular communities who are trying to come in and develop them for business purposes. So at a later time, I'll get into who wrote the legislation for the Opportunity Zone and the Opportunity Fund concept. I'll get into how it's great that the rappers and athletes are being introduced to it, but there also is a big, big possibility that the people who these artists represent and, the, and who admire these artists and athletes the most will benefit the least for what ends up coming from the eventual investment. So all you have to do is just keep your eyes on whatever may be going on in the areas where the artists are from and track who the actual capital is coming from and then get to where we wanted to go tonight, which is the reason why so much economic development and community development never has transpired at the hands of athletes and entertainers and artists is because so little entrepreneurial development at the mass level is created from the foundation and the inspiration in the community that the, the artist comes from. And what the Opportunity Zone was actually trying to get around and diminish is individual business growth, startups, mom and pop from the ground up, people from the neighborhood starting businesses. They're the last thought. They're the afterthought in this idea that you develop an economy in these quote unquote distressed areas. The Opportunity Zone concept is get a big wealthy investor from outside of the community, have them put in money, and then all of the other things will form around it. Well, first thing you know, you got the neighborhood has to be safe. So it wouldn't matter whether you were a small business or a multinational corporation or investment house. If the neighborhood's not safe, there's going to be no business activity or development. So our approach at Hip Hoppreneur is all of these tax incentives are nice. You can play them and, and make them work to your advantage. But if you're not committed to creating a mass movement and entrepreneurship and helping small businesses survive past their first, second, third, fourth, and fifth year when they usually die, there will never be community development past a certain point. The elite artist, the elite athlete will benefit. And to their credit, they will probably inspire a lot of great uh, business activity. But in terms of brick and mortar, mom and pop, businesses that satisfy the basic needs and wants of the community, those do not uh, benefit from these type of um, schemes and formulas. And I mean that in the best sense of the word. There's a place for all of this. But the foundation has to be people that live in these areas creating and then monetizing their creative creativity in a way 
where people where they're serving one another. And so that model has not yet been introduced on a mass level from the perspective of the artist or the athlete or the entertainer, and certainly not in terms of public policy. That has to be done um, in the private sector and it has to be a cultural phenomenon first. So let's go to the community cash box and the sources of cash outflows. This is how the money leaves the community. Purchases are made outside of the community. Purchases are made within the community by community residents when the value added is supplied by non-community residents. Each one of these 1B, 2Bs, we go over these with our clients and we'll go over them in more depth in the future. Taxes bring money out. Rental payments to absentee landlords. And this is part of the concern that I have with some of the um, opportunity zone formulations is you may have investors from another part of the country owning properties and owning assets and the profit and the rent is leaving the community. But you may have a big athlete or a big artist name on it, making you think that they're a partner, but you, you may not know what their percentage of the investment is. Loan repayments, savings and investments of community residents held outside of the community. Another question that I have is what happens to the community based banks under these um, empowerment zones, enterprise communities, opportunity zones. If there's no financial intermediation, meaning that the that the that the savings, the earnings don't become savings and the savings don't become capital and the capital doesn't become wealth and the wealth doesn't become invested in assets. If that chain reaction doesn't happen then it doesn't matter how much investment comes into the community to develop land and to and as a real estate play. And then lastly, patroni patronization by community residents of rackets operated by non-community residents. That previously was the drug trade, that was prostitution, that was the numbers racket. I've written about that uh, extensively at the American Affairs Journal, where the criminal as entrepreneur was actually an inspiring figure. Uh, once they are figures that come from the community, it may be, and you can and you can look at Har Harlem's numbers racket, um, but we'll send a piece out, we'll post a piece that I wrote in great detail that talked about how every ethnic community had that experience with crime and how it resulted in some level of the entrepreneurial development that was informal and illegal became formal and legal and it became constructive. And then another ethnic community came and took over and did the same thing. And then another ethnic community came and did the same thing. So I document that extensively in, in some other work. So what we want to see is we want to see this question answered. How much of the income, revenue and wealth generated by sports, art and entertainment flows into the community cash box? How much of it goes into banks? How much of it goes into other businesses? How much of it goes into jobs? So the government and the opportunity zone uh, regulations don't require that all of this be measured yet. They're, they're attempting. The IRS is trying to get guidelines. The Treasury Department is trying to get guidelines on how to actually track it and measure it. But experience shows that the money will come in, the investments will be made, and then on the back end, it'll be an afterthought to actually track and see how effective it truly is. All right. So... Let's look at a few questions. If anyone has sent in a question, I want to take that. <laughs> you, got, you guys have some interesting comments. But let me um, publish this one. This is uh, Charles Supply Chains Matter. They do. Supply Chains Matter. I want to say something about Armadale Vodka in a minute, dealing with the, the Jay-Z model. Chris, matter of fact, let me, before I bring up Chris's question, let me deal with that. So, um, right around the time, I'm trying to get the exact year, but if you, if you see much of Jay-Z's wealth has gone, has come from a, uh, alcoholic beverages, I think at least 400 million of the 1 billion is from beverages. So many of you will remember 
that the rock, the whole crew, they had their own, they got tired of promoting other people's uh, brands. And so they started their own Armadale vodka. Well, as an economist, I would get questions and I would advise people um, on the issue of distribution. So distribution was a problem across platforms. And so I would uh, deal with the question of, okay, if you're not making the product and service, how can you do that? And then once you make it, how do you distribute it? So the Rockefeller crew asked me a question about Armadale Vodka. Because even though they were selling the brand and making it available and popularizing it, they did not know how to um, make it or distribute it. So there was always a question of how can you make the product and distribute it? And so if you go back and look at the early marketing of that brand, you'll see the trials and tribulations. This is a very difficult thing to do, which is to solve the distribution problem that we have with any product. Doesn't matter what it is. There's always a, a problem with making it in the community or um, in the jurisdiction of the person who's the founder. That's always a dream. Oh, I have a new product. I want to make it. I want to employ everybody that I, that I know. And to some degree, this is President Trump's theme about, you know, made in America. Why does everything have to be made abroad? Well, it's the same principle with community development. So anyone that tells you they have a problem with artists wanting to build things in their neighborhood. Well, why do you know, many of these same people have no problem with made in America. Economic nationalism is the same principle. So. That was a question that Jay-Z and Dame and Biggs and street and other people who were involved could not answer. And so some of the untold history, maybe it'll come out, will be really what happened to Armadale Vodka. That's an important story because Jay-Z was able to move in that direction with beverages that he partnered with that were owned by other people or he uh, played a foundational role. But still, it was not something that was distilled. There was no brewery. There was no distillery. There was no bottling company that was owned by the artists and their partners, their original partners. So, yeah, um, MCM has another point. In 2002, however, Rockefeller Records announced they would be taking over U.S. distribution rights for Armadale Vodka. So this is around 03, and I want to say 04, where we had this conversation about the distribution problem. And it wouldn't matter what the product is. It's still going to always be that distribution problem. Okay, Chris has a question. We published Chris. Chris says, in looking at all the streams of income potential that you listed, is there an order in which an artist should focus, i.e., would an artist seek corporate and community partners before they are monetizing? So, Chris, the Jay-Z model would be, yeah. <laughs> you you know you get a partner first someone who's who's established at doing something and knows what they're doing um but i wouldn't say that from the beginning i think that i think at the beginning you have to be customer centric meaning make sure that what you're doing is good make sure that what you're doing works make sure that there's a market for it and there's a service for it and so at Hip Hoppreneur, we focus more on that, the actual plan, the idea, the market research. We walk you through how to do that and identifying what the needs are in your community, the basic needs and wants. I mean, there's nothing that is totally nothing wrong with having a barbershop, a beauty salon, a car wash, a wash and fold laundry mat. These are huge money makers. And the ultimate is the convenience store. We'd love to see an artist and an athlete championing their ownership of the local bodega. So that's what we're focused on, the bottom-up aspect of entrepreneurial development. So if you have any other questions, uh, send those in. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, MCM. I want to, um, uh, to Chris's point, I want to pull something up. 
this right here is kind of like the walkthrough of the service. So with entrepreneurial development, we want to build a business in the community. That's that's the mantra. That's the goal. That's the standard. So let's talk about how this relates to you and your artistry, how you're marketed, because that ultimately is still the question of someone who see them sees themselves as an artist and is giving their heart and soul to creativity. So in the era that was dominated by radio, the priority was the music. OK. Then it was the personalities. Then it was promotion and, and there were community. OK. Radio personalities, then promotions. And then then re you reach the community. The main thing I want you to focus on is music was most important. Community was least important. So just focus on that 70s, 80s, 90s. The music mattered the most. The community mattered the least. But in social media, that's reversed. The community matters the most because everything you're doing takes place in the context of a group setting. Even if you're promoting yourself, you're doing so in the context of a group. So in the era where social media dominates the priority is community, then personalities, then promotions, then the music. And this is a this is a hard pill for a lot, not just artists. This is a hard pill for really outstanding activists and business persons in the in the industry today. They don't know how to think that the human being and the and the society of human beings is what you should be rewarded for touching. It, it's seen as superficial in the eyes of some, but really it's the other way around because as I mentioned in, in week one, I believe, the performer was never separated from the sound. So live performance was always, you saw the person, you were in their presence, they made the music or they sung. The sale of purely reco recorded audio music, that's a recent phenomenon over the last hundred years or so. So the social media has really brought back the unity between visual arts, performance art and sound, which is the natural condition. So if you can just start with the idea that community matters most. And then get into personality and then get into promotion. And then see how all of that impacts your music, because the music is already there. You already know what you want to do. And if you and if you can do that without fear that it's going to disrupt the way you make music. You are already in the new era. So let's look at the psychology of this. The community knows it gave birth to the artist celebrity and that it is the source of their credibility and their capital. So every hood feels this way about the artists that they produce. They're proud of them. But they know that that artist is successful. They're standing on the shoulders of unseen masses of people who supported them early on when nobody else wouldn't or who actually helped them develop their craft. People in their neighborhood who never get a songwriting credit or a production royalty. So they know that they gave birth to the artist celebrity and that they're the source of their credibility and capital. So now it looks for itself. The community now wants to see itself in your art because now the community can be seen. So they want to see that there's some form of acknowledge, acknowledgement and that there's some credibility in the art and the message and the work. So you might be able to, you know, maybe 10 years ago, you get away with a shout out, repping your hood. But now we can see where you live. We can see who you partner with, who you associate with. We can see what kind of projects you work on, what charity you do. If, if the community doesn't see themselves in all of every other walk of life that you're in, then you have a not only a, a feedback loop issue because the community will tell you you have a credibility issue because now you can become disconnected from the community in front of the whole world and revealed to be disconnected. So the talent agent, the record label, the management business model is giving way to the demand for community development. It's as simple as what I just said. Talent agent may want to just book you. Um, the record label may just want to sell your record. 
and management may want to put you on a tour or have you enter into certain types of agreement. But the but the bottom line is they can do all of that outside of the community. Talent agent doesn't have to live in the community. The record label doesn't have to be signing you from where you live. And the management company can operate, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of miles away. But the community where you came from is walking now with you all through every step of the way. And they want to share in the revenue. They want to share in the assets that you're creating. They want to share in the wealth that you're creating. So you have to find there has to be some renegotiation now where the community is more than just a consumer of your artwork. And so that's the that's the model. And that was and again, that's why Nipsey Hussle resonated. It really had little to do with the music. It had to do with the fact that the community was with him. Never dis, never detached, never disconnected. At, at his early uh, stage of his career, unfortunately, he was killed. But you can't really see daylight between him and where he came from. Even his Eritrean family, he was closing the gap getting better acquainted with his African roots. So where this is a new era where artists don't just get rich individually. They build institutions and create a legacy for a collective to share. And so now that's what you have to do as an artist. Your creativity can't be limited to entertainment. Your creativity now flows into institutions, inspirational works, legacy, etc. People aren't just going to applaud because they saw you get rich and you're from where they're from. They want to actually know that you thought of them, that they can get rich with you. So you have to now open doors that the talent agent, the record label, and the management company is not going to necessarily be concerned with. So starting or owning a successful business is the best institution and legacy that an artist can establish. One, it provides an important need or want. That means, two, it doesn't depend on the rise and fall of your celebrity. And three, it helps the community cashes, the community cash flow crisis, pardon me. So one, it provides an important need or want, a business that you own. Two, it doesn't depend on the rise and fall of your celebrity. And three, it impacts this crisis, this problem that it seemingly never goes away, which is how does the, the, the talent and the rewards that come to someone who's successful, how do they maintain a flow and a cycle inside of the place that may be more responsible than any other for their success, particularly in an era where social media, internet, e-commerce allows me to do business with somebody all across the world. So I can be a member of multiple communities. So the second point is important. And this is what extends the community. Last week we talked about how the industry consistently markets people towards a 17 year old male. Well, what happens when you're 27? What happens when you're 37? We asked what happens when you're 47, 57, 67. So with a brick and mortar business, you're always relevant. You're always present, even when you're absent and your celebrity, how popular you are is irrelevant. If you're satisfying a need and want, of an individual or a neighborhood or a group of people, you will always be relevant. There's no such thing as being hot or not. You're always hot because you're serving another human being. You're serving a group of people with something that they need and that they want. So the linchpin of what we do is we have to boil down something that people have a high level of anxiety and that they're intimidated about. And that's the writing of the business plan. And that's the presentation of the core idea for investment, primarily from your first source of capital, which is always your kith and kin, your family and friends. So we focus on the three page business plan. And that helps anyone seeking to start a business, shows them how to turn their idea into a model or plan and present it briefly and clearly for an investment consideration. And two, anyone with an existing business, but no business plan helps them to develop one to pursue a loan or an investment. So you don't have to have a business plan to start a business. Most people already have a talent or skill that they're bringing to market or something that they've entered into, maybe a family business that they've inherited, but they don't really have a plan. So it's going to limit, not having a plan is going to limit how much money you can raise 
at any particular stage. Somebody's going to want to see something in writing. So you've got to have that. And so we work on developing that for people who are maybe busy with other things. Even walking you through that process will help you think through things that you may be doing unconsciously or that you may be doing consciously and can't uh, necessarily haven't, haven't had a chance to think outside of it. So one of our staple offerings, the three page business plan walks you through that. We deal with the nine personality types in business. You got the hustler, you got the gangster, you got the manager, you got the coordinator. We go through all of that, help you build your team around that. And then think about what type of investor do you want? Is this going to be mom and dad? Is this going to be some cousins? Is this going to be a mentor? Is this going to be a, another business operator who has an interest maybe in your success? So you got to learn how to profile the prospective investor. And again, being an artist gives you an advantage. And that's our goal is to help you leverage your magnetic, your magnetism, the interest that people have in you as an artist. You got to know how to turn that into something other than trivial novelty uh, interest where somebody just wants to look at you. They find you interesting, but they wouldn't do business with you. If you have a plan, three page business plan, you're in the game. So send in some more questions. Uh, before we go a little bit further on that, got another question here from Chris. Cre uh, appreciate you, Chris. Chris asks, how should an artist balance their focus between their music and their craft and other streams? Are we the point or are we at the point where they have to look at themselves more as an enterprise than an artist? Well, to me, Chris, it's more important that you see yourself as a leader first. I think it's easier for an artist to think of themselves as a leader than it is as an enterprise in this new era, because a leader has to know how to carry themselves in places where the music doesn't necessarily go. And you could still be, quote unquote, an enterprise as an artist without developing leadership qualities. So I would say the way to answer your question, the way to balance it is to see that you have many qualities, you have many interests, you have many talents and skills. Each of them has some level of monetization, meaning you can make money, you can do business, you can enter into trade and commerce on the basis of talent and skill. But then you have to know how to ask yourself the question is, is the skill, the talent, the interest is it, a, is it the basis of a business? Is it the basis of an idea, a network, and money that can be organized and sold over time repeatedly? And does it satisfy an underlying need or want in the society? So the, the type of businesses that we recommend that are, are non-music related, the music related businesses have been well-traveled territory. But the ability for you to become relevant in different streams of income. And again, I, I stick with the cash flow, very liquid businesses, bodega store, barber shop, beauty salon, restaurant, wash and fold laundromat, plumbing company, electrical company, construction company. All of these things, there's always going to be a need for them. And as an artist, you're already predisposed to have the attention of the people and to be a leader. And then now with that profile, you become relevant in the politics of where you're from. You become relevant in the business community. You become a factor of power when it comes to speaking to educational issues, to healthcare issues. Anything that goes on at that local level, the regional level, the national level, you now are a, a stakeholder. You're a shareholder. You're someone who the people can respond to on the basis of your credibility and your intellect and your service, not just your entertainment value. So hopefully that answer your question, uh, Chris. And now the ideation of it, how do you conceive and uh, perceive of an opportunity? Many of the same skill sets that an artist will use to come up with a, a song title or a concept or an epiphany is the same with a business. I've written about this in my book series, The Entrepreneurial Secret. The ability to perceive and conceive of an opportunity is a skill, it's a gift, but it's something that you work at. To me, it's a creative process. 
So running a business and managing a business may not be seen as like creative or artistic, but coming up with the idea definitely is. And so you need to know what to do. Just how you get an idea and you start to write a song, you need to know what to do when you get an idea for a business. And so in some respects, the, um, the three-page business plan will help you kind of turn that idea into a song, just as it happens when you, when you write a rhyme or, or whatever else you do. And as usual with us, each step combines one hour of consultation with five hours of application to deliver a significant result. So sign up for a consultation uh, today. And just to close out, I want to double back on what we talked about with Nipsey Hussle and Jay-Z. These are not the only two models for you to follow. They're, they're both worthy of some level of emulation, some level of, they certainly should be inspiring to you always. But you're a unique individual. And so you can't be turned into a commodity and you can't just photocopy what somebody did and make it credible and resonate for you. What Jay-Z did, a lot of that came out of his partnership with Dame and Biggs early on. And then he was able to be positioned in a certain way because he had those two figures around him. And that lent itself to a perception of him in business where there were people who wanted to deal with him more than wanted to do business with the others and vice versa. Um, in the case of Nipsey Hussle, I think him being from L.A., him being a member of a street organization him being a member of a of a diaspora community with a with another homeland. All of that played into what he was able to do. If Nipsey Hussle's from another neighborhood, if he's not African, uh, doesn't have African heritage that, you know, one generation, his parents are, you know, are here in America. His father is, is African and he's able to go back and there's still family members in Africa. Unlike, you know, the descendants of slaves that are here that don't have that first generation connection. Um, that was a factor in his success. So one of the things that we focus on, we'll talk about next week is the kinship power plane. Nipsey had his kinship thoroughly rooted in through the street organization and through his African culture. They, that the, the kinship was thoroughly present in his storyline, in his brand, and in his song. So if you can weave your kith and kin into your music, into your conversation, into your ability to generate data, which we'll talk about next week, when we go into power brokering, that sets the stage for you to be seen as more than an artist. That sets a stage for you to do business with more than just your creative work. If people know that, that you have a following and a network, and this is a network that you can turn from fans who purchase music into people who purchase products, then that opens the door, not just for endorsement deals and licensing, but it opens the door for negotiation. That's what you want. You want a business negotiation because you represent a network that can be seen and one that can't be seen. And that's the power of being a leader who does business and starts a business in the community where they come from. One, you have a fan base that buys your music. You can, you can present that. Anyone can come to one of your shows. You can show how much music you sold. Then you have another group that people can't see. You got their email addresses. You have feedback from them. You have survey data. You have, um, connections to institutions that represent numbers. You can walk into any strip mall. People know you because you've patronized them. You didn't just come to them for support in your career. It wasn't a one way street. So some people can just do that naturally through charisma, but it should be intentional more and more. And this is kind of like to Chris's point. You have to balance the intention that you have as an artist and now couple that with intention as a, as a leader and servant and member of a community. The number one thing that people um, tend to want to do when you become successful is to make your significance the basis of disconnection and detachment. But now, the more successful you are, the more you want to be remain connected. So it's really like totally counterintuitive to what we've been taught.
special and unique meant over there, elite, exile, far away, removed, disconnected. Now success means rooted, connected, accessible, um, capable of being touched. So let's get a last look at this community cash box. Put the whole thing up so you can look at it in its totality. This is what we want to be focused on. All of these, I think, 15 factors. If you can, if you have an awareness of each of these, you're in good shape. You're a business person. You're a leader. You've got to know what's coming in and out of the community and where your place is within it. And then find the right a particular entry point for you to stake your claim on, for what issues you may want to stand on, what problem you think you're best positioned to solve. And so owning a business is one of the best ways to do that. So contact us for a consultation. We'll start exactly where we are. We'll, we'll take an inventory of the community where you live. We'll show you how to do that, show you how to turn whatever you conceive and perceive of as an opportunity into a plan that you could present, how to test it, how to research it, or maybe invest in something that's already existing. If you already are in a position to invest, but you want to be an owner, you want that business as an asset to increase your net worth and to bring in another income stream, this is the way you should want a plan to be written and presented to you for investment. So again, I want to thank you all. Week number three, entrepreneurial development, a lot of food for thought. Next week, we get into power brokering. This is our fourth and final week. Spread the word and review parts one and two if you would like. So you might be in a better position to get the most out of uh, session number four. So we started out with the leadership profile. We went into brand alignment. This week is entrepreneurial development, the bottom up model. And then next week we deal with power brokering, negotiation, how to expand your power from your natural if, um, qualities and from the network of kith and kin that you are already rooted in. We're all born into a bloodline. We all have an inheritance of DNA or money or knowledge or geography. There's no getting around it. You've got one of those or even a body of work that someone has shared with you or the benefits and insights through wisdom and knowledge that they've shared and imparted to you. We all have an inheritance and we have to leverage that. So I want to thank you all for joining us. If there's any last questions, send it in now. I'll, I'll try to take it on my way out. Thank you to MCM and Chris uh, for your thoughtful questions. Cedric Muhammad, CEO of the Hip Hoppreneur. And again, June 26, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern will be our uh, final installment of this four webinar series beyond success in the music. I like to call it the new era where a story is more valuable than a brand or a song. Take care. Artists of today, you're existing in the moment of memes and short attention spans, where music sales are not enough. Profits per stream are a percentage of a penny. And although in a matter of minutes, a viral video can change your circumstances, when your flame fluctuates, what do you have left? At Hip Hoppreneur, the music industry's first leadership consultancy, we provide you with the tools to answer that question and hone your talent beyond the music, allowing you to define your impact in a more meaningful and sustainable way. That's why we've designed a live streaming series called Discover Success Beyond the Music. The series will introduce artists to four key elements, leadership, brand alignment, entrepreneurial development, and power brokering. These factors develop individuality and guide as a blueprint for long-term success beyond the mic, outside the art, and the industry. In this new era, leaders have access to places where many artists won't and where brands get left behind. Register now at the hiphoppreneur.com. Hip Hoppreneur, because artists mature.